So again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to talk to you uh, about an R package that I've been developing over the last couple of years that um, fits a particular class of dynamic models, which I hope can be useful for ecological time series and, and forecasting purposes. <clears throat> um, so the reason that I, I work on this um, I think is the reason the Ecological Forecast Initiative has become so popular over the last couple of years is because um, I really like this quote from Mike Dietz from a few years ago and, and some of his colleagues it really resonates with me about this idea that any decision that we make um, in our daily lives, whether it's for work purposes or just for uh, anything that we're, we're happening to do, those decisions always depend on some kind of forecast that we're making, um, whether it be a quantitative forecast that might guide a management decision or whether we decide to go get groceries today or tomorrow, we're always making some prediction about what we think is going to happen in the future. And so our decisions are always inherently tied to some kind of forecast. Um, and that's very useful for thinking about how we can use prediction um, in ecology to, to guide a little bit more about what we're going to do and what kinds of models we might want to make about the systems that we're studying. Um, <clears throat> and in today's world, um, this is becoming perhaps even more increasingly relevant um, as we get access to more data and as things we're, we're understanding more about how things are changing more quickly. Um, and I really like this slide because I think it kind of illustrates the problem that we face as ecologists. You know, we, we like to think that we're working in, in a big data era, um, but most people tend to think of big data as kind of long data with many, many, many observations. And sometimes that's the case, but also we're dealing more and more now with wide data. We've got data from many different types of um, sources and they have different spatio-temporal resolutions. Um, and each of these data sets might cover a different kind of aspect of whatever it is that we're trying to study and understand. And so really making sense of all of this data um, and putting it together in a way that we can make use of it and get something out of it from a, from a useful model, for example, is a real challenge um, that we face as ecologists. And this is kind of the space that um, I try and work in where we, we try and put together lots of different multi-structured data sets um, to answer particular questions in ecology. Um, and for time series in ecology, you know, we have a lot of different types of features that we might want to deal with when trying to build relevant models. I've just listed a few of them here, but there are many others, of course. And none of these are going to be terribly surprising to you that have worked with time series before. Um, but it turns out that a lot of these features make it pretty challenging to, to fit models that are, that are useful for um, ecological time series. Um, and I'll just focus on on one feature in particular for the main topic of today's talk, which is nonlinearities. And when I talk about nonlinearities, I'm talking about relationships, perhaps, between different variables that we're studying. And we often recognize that um, basically nothing in ecology is linear, um, even though we might be able to make reasonable approximations um, with linear models sometimes. And that might be really useful and really good, but we're always a little bit uncertain or maybe a little bit dissatisfied if we can't capture some of those nonlinear relationships that we think are going to be prominent in the data that we're collecting and in the models that we're building. And so how can we actually tackle these nonlinearities when we might not have a really good preconceived idea of what that nonlinear shape might actually be? Um, and what I'm talking about today is one particular way of doing that. Um, if you've watched some of the seminar series from this group before, you would have seen these before, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time introducing them. But what you're seeing on the screen here dancing across um, is a smoothing spline. Um, the black line in particular is um, taking on various shapes of, I would call them sort of a prior set of smoothing splines. Um, and what you can see here, the main take home message is that these are hugely flexible. They can bend and curve around to meet any kind of different relationship. Um, and they're controlled by these smaller set of basis functions, these colored lines that each act in their own kind of local neighborhood. Um, if we add some weight to each of those basis functions and then add up all of their weights, we get the overall shape of the spline. So in this case, we would be fitting a spline, say, to the effect of time, which might be useful for understanding a nonlinear trend, for, for instance, in a time series. And the whole purpose of these splines is to be able to bend and wiggle so that we can smooth through some observed data. So here I've got some data points in the background, and you can see we might be fitting some kind of model, and this spline is, is smoothing through the data. 
And that's the real advantage of splines is that when we don't have a preconceived idea about what kind of nonlinear shape might be present um, or might be acting on our on our data, um, a spline can be very useful to try and and fit that nonlinear relationship. It's very important though that we smooth through the data. We don't want this spline to wiggle so much that it meets every single data point because that would be overfitting and we wouldn't be able to generalize beyond the training data very well with such a model. And so these splines are typically penalized in some way to restrict how wiggly they can be, how bendy they can actually be. And so when we're estimating these, um, we often need to estimate those weights for the basis functions as well as some kind of penalty to, to restrict the overall shape. And this is very easy to do in R, thanks to a hugely popular R, R package uh, that's maintained by Simon Wood, uh, the maintainer of the MGCV package. Um, and if you're interested in GAMS in general, uh, I would highly recommend his textbook because it goes into a lot of the theory there and has a lot of very useful applications. Um, but what you're seeing on this slide here is just the general shape of the, the linear predictor for a GAM. Um, and if you've worked with GLMs before, you'll recognize that this is really just a fancy GLM where we replace one or more of our, of our coefficients for our linear predictors with a set of smoothing functions. Okay, uh, and GLMs are hugely advantageous um, in ecology because we can work with different link functions and, and use a variety of observation models. And those observation models can handle a lot, a lot of those features that I mentioned early on that are they're very prominent in ecological data. Um, and, and GAMs in particular are very, very flexible. Um, I'm just showing a little bit of some of the possible types of uh, complex relationships that you can estimate with GAMs. For example, in the top left here, we've got a relationship between some predictor X0 um, and our outcome. And you can see we've got a slightly nonlinear shape here being smoothed through the data. Here on the top right, I've got a multidimensional spline between two predictors, X1 and X2. Um, and that's very valuable, say, for understanding spatial patterns or spatiotemporal patterns, but also other kinds of nonlinear interactions. Uh, that we might need to estimate in, in data. Down on the left, we've got a slightly wigglier spline through the, this set of data points. And then on the bottom right is something that's very useful to highlight is that um, here we fit a spline for this uh, predictor X4, uh, but because there's no support for nonlinearity in the data, the spline itself has actually been shrunk to a flat line. Um, and so that's a, a, a very useful property of splines as well. Um, when we, we're not really sure whether there's a nonlinear relationship there, we can still sometimes throw a spline at it and end up with the same kind of fit that we would have gotten if we'd used a standard GLM. Um, so a big advantage there. Um, that's all I'm going to talk about when it comes to GAMs themselves, um, in particular because uh, Gavin Simpson gave a very, a very nice overview webinar for this sexual uh, seminar series a couple of years ago, um, where he goes into a lot of the details about how GAMs are estimated and the different kinds of basis functions you can use, et cetera, and some strategies there. So if you're really interested in learning more about GAMs, I'd highly recommend you have a look at his webinar and his resources. Um, and that way, all the, all the questions can be targeted at him, which is nice. <clears throat> Um, so just to wrap up, again, GAMs are basically just fancy GLMs. Um, some or all of those predictor effects might be estimated as um, potentially nonlinear smooth functions. Um, and we estimate uh, penalties as well to try and restrict the shapes of those functions so that we're not overfitting. Um, but the complexity, of course, is, is enormous, so very valuable for, for many types of ecological models. Um, <clears throat> but I've talked a lot about the good things um, about splines, but I think it's worth highlighting a limitation of splines that's often not really recognized uh, when we use these. Um, and so the way I'm going to highlight that is to use a simulated uh, time series here. So I've got the time series here in the top left. You can see over time, uh, the value Y is just a, sort of a Gaussian time series with lots of autocorrelation and maybe some kind of nonlinear trend. You know, not that uncommon to see these kinds of patterns in ecological time series or any kind of time series. And down here on the bottom left, you can see the autocorrelation function, strong autocorrelations at, at a large range of lags. 
Um, all of these would suggest that we would need to take care of this autocorrelation uh, when trying to fit a model to these data if we wanted to understand any kind of predictor relationships or, or make forecasts or something like that. And so what I'm going to do here is use the MGCV package um, and fit a, a GAM to these data. I'm just going to fit a spline of time. Um, and the actual details of this, what you're seeing here in this wrapper, this S function, which is the main or one of the main functions for fitting splines in the GAM um, uh, function in MGCV. This just tells you a little bit about how you can control the complexity of these splines. Again, if you're not used to what these represent, don't worry too much um, about those details right now. Just understand you can control the number of basis functions, which limits the kind of overall complexity of that possible spline. You can control the type of spline you're using. Here I'm using a B spline, and I'm setting the penalty on the second um, derivative, the squared second derivative. And you can control all of these to get a little bit more flexibility in what you might actually uh, do with these models, which is, again, a big advantage of splines. Um, but the interface is, again, very, very simple um, to use. And if you haven't worked with MGCV before, it doesn't take very long to learn to use um, the formula syntax. OK, so I fit that spline to these data. And if we look at the, say, posterior predictions um, against the actual observed data points, here I'm showing uh, credible intervals from this model. MGCV uses an empirical Bayesian estimation technique, so it's very easy to extract um, posterior intervals. Um, and these intervals just show various colors that are uh, various um, confidence levels, basically, or credible interval levels. But again, the, the spline is smooth through the data really well. We'd be really happy if we were to fit a model to these data. And if all we wanted to do was control for that sort of nonlinear trend in that autocorrelation, this might be enough to be able to kind of handle that while, while automatically giving us um, better inferences on whatever it is that we're trying to understand, say, other predictor effects, for instance. So we'd be really happy with that. But if we then say, OK, what if we want to extrapolate ahead? You know, We're talking about forecasting here, and we want models that can make reasonable predictions. And here I'm going to show how this actually works for some splines. Uh, so for this spline, we're extrapolating ahead two, two time steps. And you can see the uncertainty is growing into the future, which is what we want with a time series model. Um, and overall, the shape of the spline is taking on the same form uh, that it took on at the very end of the training data over here. So anything beyond this dashed line is basically an extrapolation in this uh, plot. So we wouldn't be too unhappy with that. But then if we continue extrapolating on a, up to five steps now, we're starting to see some concerning behaviors because this thing is continuing to go up linearly, um, even though we haven't seen any real linear form throughout all of the training data. Um, and if I extend ahead again, now we're starting to get really worried because, um, again, the pattern that's being shown here in the forecast is nothing like what the spline has learned over the historical sort of time period. The uncertainty is growing, but it's not really growing in any kind of principled way. And I can tell you that uh, the uncertainty is usually not very well calibrated against what we want to, to predict in a forecast. And the reason this is happening is because, remember, an important point about these basis functions is they only have local knowledge. They only really understand what's going on in their local neighborhood. So even though the whole spline is wiggling around, you know, this yellow basis function really only knows what's happening from here to here. It doesn't understand what's going on anywhere else. And so as soon as we extend beyond those basis functions, we don't really have a lot to go on in terms of extrapolating that spline. And that's probably a bit easier if I just look at some realizations of this spline. So we, just individual possible curves that the model has estimated. And you can see here, as soon as we start extrapolating, it just continues on wherever it stopped. Basically, if it wiggled slightly up at the end, it's going to extrapolate linearly up in that same direction forever. Or if it wiggled slightly down, it'll wiggle down forever. And if we look at more realizations, we can start to see a little bit about how that uncertainty envelope is being formed in that extrapolation period. And again, looking at more and more, you can start to understand a little bit about the problems here. Again, you know what's going on here in this extrapolation um, horizon uh, does not resemble at all what the spline has learned in the historical time period. And that ends up in giving us very bad forecasts about what's actually likely to happen in the future for this particular time series. Um, now, this is 
again, this is widely known uh, if you understand GAM theory or spline theory, but it's something that uh, we tend to not recognize very well when we're fitting these models. It's not always obvious when are we extrapolating and when are we not, um, and what is that extrapolation behavior. So it's always worth doing some simulations like this to try and understand uh, the limitations of, of the, these kinds of models. But what we really want is something like this. Say if we were to fit um, some kind of curve to those data points, you know, the actual behavior of this curve in the historical training period is being resembled in the extrapolation, in the actual forecast. And if I look at a few different realizations of this particular function, all of these are behaving quite nicely. They understand a little bit about how things have changed in the past, and they're using that understanding to generate much more realistic and much better um, predictions. And then again, if we look at all of our posterior um, uncertainty intervals, this particular model, um, which is not that complex, not that difficult to fit, um, does much better in giving better predictions. And so the purpose of um, this talk is really to try and introduce models that allow us to do this. So we still want to fit splines to data in ecology. You know, it's not that often that we're extrapolating too far beyond the range of the training data, if we say to fit a relationship between temperature and population abundance, for example, and we want to generate a forecast, you know, it's pretty likely that the temperature in the future is not going to be that terribly different to the temperature in the past. So we're not going to be extrapolating too far. And a spline might do really well in a situation like that. Um, but if we're trying to extrapolate over time, where obviously time is going to change in the future, uh, then we might want to think about replacing that spline with some kind of more appropriate time series model. And so a dynamic GAM in the way that I describe it is just to augment this linear predictor, just add a term there, which might capture something about uh, latent dynamics in this time series. And this latent dynamic process can take a huge variety of forms um, that allow us a lot of flexibility to try and model different types of time series, including univariate and multivariate um, time series. And so the MVGAM package, which is the one that I'm introducing um, today, has been designed to fit these kinds of models. Uh, these are fit in a Bayesian framework, and you can fit dynamic GAMs and GLMs, or just basic GAMs and GLMs if you don't want any time series component. And these are really advantageous. Um, you can fit hierarchical models, hierarchical intercepts and slopes, as well as hierarchical smooth functions, um, which Gavin talked a lot about in his webinar about how you can, can fit those, um, as well as some kind of latent dynamic process to capture that autocorrelation, that you know un unobserved trend that might be happening in your time series. There are also options to fit these in a state space framework, and there's a really nice webinar again, on this series about state-based models. So I'd encourage you to look at that if you haven't heard of these before and how useful they can be. Yeah, but they basically separate out your error process. You can have a process error as well as measurement error um, and different covariates on each of those, which is useful. The package is basically built off MGCV. Um, it's, it uses MGCV to construct all the smoothing spline objects that you need um, to be able to fit splines to data. Um, and then it uh, creates um, a modeling code for you. So these are all fit in a Bayesian framework. Um, and the main uh, tool that I, I use as the back end is Stan, uh, which fits Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, which is probably one of the most advanced sort of MCMC algorithms that we have available for a broad class of, of general models. So it's very useful and very efficient, um, which is necessary because these models can get quite complex uh, very quickly. And I've tried hard to maintain the sort of consistent R interface that you're used to seeing, you know, the formula interface. Um, love it or hate it, R has a very particular formula interface for uh, specifying models, and lots of R packages use this. And so it's good to try and maintain consistency there so you're not too bombarded um, with different um, types of formula interfaces. And again, the package can handle univariate and multivariate time series from a, a wide range of response distributions thanks to that uh, GLM framework. Um, just a few of these um, that the package can currently handle. You know, you can handle real value data with your standard Gaussian or student T observation models, as well as say positive real values for through a log normal or a gamma distribution. Um, and it can support proportional data as well, which we'll talk about today in the in the coding exercise. If you got uh, real values that are bounded at zero and one as well as non-negative integers. Um, the package was originally designed just to work with count data like Poisson or negative binomial. Um, 
because I couldn't find a lot of good resources for, for fitting time series models to that kind of data um, in existing R packages. But it's basically expanded on uh, through development since then. The types of predictor effects that you can fit in this package, there's quite a wide range of these effects, and some of these might not seem that familiar to you. Um, but here's the one that we were using previously, this S wrapper, um, which is from MGCV, which allows you to fit smoothing splines to one or more covariates. And again, there's lots of flexibility in what kinds of basis functions you can use and, and how you can control the potential um, complexity of those splines. But there's also a nice wrapper or a nice type of um, basis through that S wrapper that allows you to specify hierarchical models, so random intercepts and random slopes. You can fit multi-dimensional splines of two or more covariates, and there's lots of, again, more complexity that you can handle there through different wrappers. Again, these are all available in MGCV, so if you've worked in that before, then they shouldn't seem too unfamiliar to you. Um, but something that you might not have seen before, you can fit a Gaussian process function with a squared exponential kernel um, of one covariate, so they're really handy for replacing splines if you want to generate better extrapolations because they tend to give much better predictions into the future than a spline does, as well as time varying effects. Uh, we work a lot with time series uh, data in ecological forecasting, and so we might expect some of those uh, predictor effects to change smoothly over time, and you can do that in this package as well. Um, an important point to note is that any of these effects can take place on either the observation process through the observation model or on the actual um, process model itself. So what you're actually trying to model, but you can't directly observe. Um, and that's very useful, again, in ecology, um, working in a state space framework um, where you might think certain predictors impact whatever it is that I'm studying. And then other predictors might impact my ability to take measurements of that particular phenomenon. And you can try and incorporate both of those in these kinds of models. Um, and again, we can incorporate temporal dynamics. We don't actually need to regress the outcome itself on its own past values, which causes problems when you've got measurement error and when you've got missing values, because we've got this latent dynamic process happening in the model. In terms of those dynamic processes, there's a pretty wide range that are available in MVGAM. Uh, and I'll just highlight some of those briefly. So you can have the standard sort of a random walk uh, that we're probably all pretty familiar with how those evolve or an autoregressive process up to order three uh, to try and capture that autocorrelation and possibly uh, maintain stationarity if you want to. Um, or a Gaussian process as well, which can be fit to the, the time component. And these are very useful when uh, you want to have a little bit more control over the possible shape of those functions that it can, it can take. For example, the length scale parameter here um, controls how, how quickly these change over time, how quickly the sort of correlations decay over time. And so a longer length scale, like a, a length scale of 16, for example, in this case, leads to these kind of smooth functions. Whereas if we set a shorter link scale, we can get much more wiggly functions that sort of oscillate a bit more quickly. And so you can put uh, particular priors on that link scale if you want to give a, a much more sort of informed um, prior understanding of what you think might actually be happening in your time series. Again, we're working in a Bayesian framework here, so it's very useful and very uh, handy to be able to use um, any informative priors that you have about the system. Uh, which would give you more power to estimate relationships through noisy data or sparse data. Um, we can also fit multivariate time series models. So for example, I'm showing here a vector autoregression of order one. Um, and these are very useful for approximating Granger causality, where you know the state of the process at time t for each species, for example, can potentially influence the state of the process at time t plus one for any of the other species. And so these can capture these kind of interaction effects that we often think are happening when we study, say, multiple species um, in one particular plot. And we want to try and model all of those dynamics at once. Another way that we can capture multivariate relationships is through a dynamic factor model. Um, these are very useful for um, dimension reduction. So if you've ever worked in joint species distribution models, uh, those sort of latent variable models are, are, are handy when we have lots of species or lots of time series in this case. But we don't want to estimate lots of temporal trends because um, it might be too compu computationally expensive or demanding. So I'm showing here how these kind of work. I've got four different time series shown in the red. And I'm propagating a single 
um, estimated model, a time series model shown in black, which is the dynamic factor. And if we estimate that dynamic factor and how it evolves over time, we can also estimate weights for how each of these time series depend on that factor. They can be positive or negative weights. And those loading coefficients sort of control that dependency of those series on the dynamic factor or the set of factors. Um, you can have more than one factor if you want, which is very good for inducing correlations between these time series. We might think that there are relationships going on there. But we don't actually know what those relationships might be um, a priori. And so a dynamic factor model is a very useful way of trying to capture that um, while saving us computation. They're also very handy for forecasting. For example, if we wanted to make predictions for each of these four time series, we really only need to extrapolate the dynamic factor ahead. And then we use the weights that we've estimated from the historical time series to, to generate the forecast for each of those observed time series. So again, dynamic factor models kind of fit in with a lot of what we want to do in ecology when we're working with um, many different response variables. Just to highlight here a bit about the interface um, and what it looks like. Uh, again, it, it tries to, to mimic a bit a lot of what you see with other formula interfaces in R, um, particularly the MGCV package. So you specify, specify your observation formula. Here I'm just showing a variety of different kinds of things that can go in there, random effects and random slopes and parametric effects as well. Um, and then you specify the data, and I'll talk in a moment about what the data uh, should look like, as well as the observation family and the particular kind of um, dynamic trend model that you want to fit. And then you have options for controlling the, the actual MCMC sampler. Um, I'm not showing here, but again, you can have a separate formula for the process model. Um, so that this would act on the observations, and then you'd have a separate set of predictors that operate on the actual uh, dynamic process as well for fitting a state space model. The data basically look exactly like they would look like for any other regression uh, package in R or the main regression packages um, where we would just specify it in long format. So here I've got multiple time series. I've got four different time series that are indexed by the series indicator here, but I've only got a single column uh, for the outcome, uh, which is called Y in this case. Um, and so this is this is just a typical long format, uh, which makes it easy to set up multivariate uh, time series models. You can have missing values in the response. That's no problem in these models. They're not going to get thrown out, um, but you will get predictions for those uh, when the model is being estimated. Um, and so we need that response variable uh, in long format, and we need an indicator of which time series we're working with. Um, and this needs to be set up as a factor uh, variable. Um, and the coding exercise will go into a little bit more detail about, about that. The last thing that's needed is a time indicator. So these, these models all work in discrete time. It's important to, to make that distinction. We're not working with continuous time models here. Uh, but again, these are very common in ecological data. So we just need to set the actual time step as an integer, for example, that's, that's continually increasing. And then from there, it's just a matter of incorporating any other predictors that we, we think we need um, in the model. And again, they all can go in the same data frame. Uh, so a very simple um, format for the data. You shouldn't need to work too hard, I would hope, to, to rearrange the data to try and meet the needs of this package, which is good because often that's where a lot of mistakes can come in when it comes to data processing. Um, you can make various kinds of predictions. I won't talk a lot about this here, but just understand with, with GLMs and especially Bayesian GLMs, you can get predictions for different kinds of quantities on the linear predictor scale, say the link scale, or on the response scale, or the expectation. And depending on what you want to do with the model or what inference you want to make, you might want to use these predictions um, in different ways. And they're very easy to, to get from the model because we've got a full Bayesian posterior distribution, so we can just extract any of these uh, at any time. But I won't dwell on that very much. The typical workflow that I would expect users to, to use when, when implementing this package is basically to fit a variety of models that might include you know, nonlinear splines or dynamic processes to time series. And you might build those models in slowly in complexity and then use uh, various kinds of diagnostics to understand where is this model failing. Um, the package offers various kinds of posterior predictive checks that you can use as well as um, randomized quantile residuals. 
um, which allow you to sort of understand a little bit. And then the same kind of diagnostics that you would use for any uh, linear model will apply here. And so we want to make sure that uh, you're, you're meeting the assumptions of, of the model as well as you can. Something else that the package can handle is, is using the marginal effects package to generate more reportable and more interpretable model predictions. Um, I'll talk about that in the coding exercise, but this is a really valuable way to try and understand these models. You know, as you'll see from these, you get lots and lots of coefficient estimates in your summary, um, but those coefficients don't really mean anything on their own for a spline. They really only mean something jointly together. And so really the easiest way to understand these models is to make predictions um, through sort of targeted scenario based um, predictions. And this package really makes that easy to do that. Um, other things you can do, you can produce probabilistic forecasts um, from the package, um, from these models in a number of different ways. And you can evaluate those, those forecasts with proper scoring rules, which again is very valuable to try and understand, well, is this model actually giving better forecasts than competing models? Um, I've got a variety of resources. Um, and these are slowly growing um, in uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, including a, a few vignettes to talk about the overview of the package and how you might format data from different formats, as well as some, some case studies about different ways that you can fit these um, models and different kinds of questions you can ask uh, with this package. Um, so feel free to look at those resources. Um, they're all, uh, if you go to the GitHub site um, that Jody linked to, um, you'll be able to find uh, the, the GitHub site for the package itself and how to install it, but also you'll be able to link to the package website and, and find all of these vignettes because they're all hosted in HTML. Um, and that's all I'm going to talk about for the actual talk. So if there are no questions at this point, then I'll probably go ahead and switch over um, to our studio and, and start walking through the coding example. OK, so I've got this happening now. Hopefully, everyone can see this. But let me know if you're having any difficulty seeing that. And I've made it, I've zoomed it in hopefully enough that you can um, read this. But just let me know if there's anything in particular that you want me to zoom in on or emphasize. Um, OK, so this script, which you can find in the resources that were shared around earlier, just walks through one data set um, and a couple of different types of models that you might fit to the data set and different ways that you can use the package to try and interrogate data. I'll just clear these plots so I'm not getting distracted here. But basically, the data that we're working with come from a long-term monitoring study uh, near the town of Portal in Arizona, um, which is aiming to understand you know, variation in the relative abundances or the abundances of desert rodent species. Um, so it's a really valuable data set. Some of you have probably heard of it if you've worked in ecological forecasting enough called the Portal Project. Um, and there, I've given a few key references here uh, that you can read about these data. Um, they're all openly accessible. You know, The team that, that manages this study have done a wonderful job to try and um, use them to help with open science. And so you can access the data almost in real time. They go out every lunar month and trap rodents on a sort of fixed grid of traps. Um, and ask various questions about what might be driving the sort of long-term dynamics of these rodent species. <clears throat> so a really valuable data set. And so um, I'm working with a few different packages and I've given you a list of packages that you'll need to install um, and able to work with, uh, with this particular exercise. So I'll just go ahead and load those. And I think I've already got those loaded anyway. <clears throat> um, just to make a note about some of these packages, again, Imbigam is the one that, obviously, the main one that I'll be talking about. And you, there's a, a few steps that you need to be able to install that because it's using Stan at the back end. Um, it can be sometimes a little bit of a headache to get Stan installed, but there are really good resources by the Stan team on ways that you can troubleshoot. But that one will probably give you the most trouble uh, for installation. Uh, but then I'll be using some other packages for you know, the very common packages from the Tidyverse for uh, manipulating data. Um, there's a very nice package by Gavin Simpson called Gratia, which is useful for um, making targeted plots of, of GAMs, um, which can work with this package, as well as marginal effects um, for other kinds of plots. Um, so I'll just, I'll be using ggplot for some of my plots. And so I like to set up a, a theme um, just to make things a bit cleaner. Um, 
but obviously those are optional for you. And then I'll load the data, which are supplied in CSV format. Um, the first thing that I like to do when loading any, any time series data is just obviously try and understand the structure of the data. So the glimpse function from dplyr is very useful to get a handle on, on how these data are structured. And here we've got a few different columns, five columns. Um, the main one we're interested in this case is the number of captures for each species. And again, this is already set up in that kind of long format. Um, if we look at the head, we can see that, um, you know, we've got time increasing uh, down here and we've got the, the indicator species, which I'll change and use as time as series indicator uh, for the package. Um, and then the captures for each one, and we can have missing values there and then any other predictors. So obviously some of these predictors are going to be repeated because these are full sort of site level predictors. So they don't change for each species and that's fine uh, for setting up in the data. <clears throat> Something else, else that's very valuable to understand when looking at time series data or for any kind of regression package uh, in R is to understand where your missing values might be. So this code here will just plot missing values. So it just arranges the data by time, um, which is the way that we want it to be arranged. Uh, and then it gives a red color for any missing values <clears throat> in, in all of the columns. And you can see here that um, for these these columns, we don't have any missing values for any um, columns except for the actual response variable captures. And again, that's fine for the package because those won't be thrown out, they'll actually be used. But some headaches you can run into with this package and any package in R is if you have missing values in some of your predictors because those currently aren't allowed um, in this package. And so um, R will often, or a lot of packages will often silently throw those out for you, which is a little bit naughty of some of those uh, packages. I think it's good to understand when they're being thrown out, uh, but they, they won't be thrown out here. You'll just get an error. So make sure you don't have any missing values in any of your predictors, but you can have missing values in your um, time series that you're interested in. <clears throat> okay, and as I mentioned in the talk, um, we need to have an indicator called series um, for these data, which is just a factor uh, that tells us which time series we're actually dealing with. It's just an ind index. <clears throat> Very easy to add that in this case, because we already have the species name. Um, so we can just use that species name to add um, that factor variable. And so if I look here, now I've got six columns and series is my indicator, which is a factor. It's important to understand the levels of these. It will The package will use all of the levels that you've got um, in your data. So if you've got more levels than you actually have observations, so you've got, you say, a, a level for a, a time series that you don't actually have any measurements for, if you've done, been doing some filtering or something, make sure you drop that level. Um, otherwise, you can get errors uh, in the package. I think it, it gives informative warnings now and tries to do that for you, but it's always good practice to, to check that anyway. <clears throat> um, and I give a little bit of an of uh, detail on, on that here. <clears throat> the last thing that we're going to do is, is uh, manipulate the actual outcome variable for these data. Um, so for this particular example, I wanted to look at relative abundance rather than just raw abundance, because relative abundance is a nice measure of um, relationships among these species. <clears throat> and so we're creating a relative abundance column, um, which basically we take the sum of captures at each time point. Uh, and then we divide the number of captures for each species by that, that sum total. <clears throat> I am giving a slight uh, floor here just for any possible observations where one species dominated the whole thing and, and had a relative abundance of one, um, because I want to use a beta regression in this case. And currently the package doesn't allow zero inflated or one inflated beta observations. There aren't many. In fact, I don't know if there are any actually in these data, but it's good practice to do that anyway. So I'm just basically creating a slight offset so we don't get any values of, of one or zero. Um, <clears throat> And so now we've got actual proportional uh, time series, which is nice to highlight one of the advantages of MVGAM to be able to handle proportional data, because if you try and handle those data um, in any other kind of time series packages, you'll quickly run into trouble. <clears throat> okay, now we're gonna start using the actual package. Um, a lot of that was just data manipulation that you might use for any time series modeling, but now I'm gonna actually use the package. And one of the 
most useful functions that it has is just to plot the data. So if we plot all of the series together, we get something that looks like this. Um, and this is just plotting all four time series together um, where we highlight one particular time series in each panel. And you can see lots of missing data, lots of sort of undulating trends for each of these species. This species tend to dominate for quite a lot and then it sort of dropped off sometime in the past. Um, this species has very small values and then rose up a little bit in the past and then sort of maybe plateaued a little bit. Uh, this one down here has quite strong seasonality, which we'll see in, in a little while. Um, and this one here is sort of moving along. So there's lots of interesting patterns in these data, lots of features, autocorrelation, uh, seasonal dynamics, missing values. And trying to capture all of these is is kind of the goal of, of this package. You know, we want to fit models um, that can meet these, this complexity rather than trying to rearrange these time series to fit into an existing modeling package, if possible. <clears throat> we can also um, just change this series argument. Instead of saying all, we can just say a particular series and just highlight one series at a time. So here, for example, I'm highlighting uh, the first time series, just so you can see a little bit of some more um, information about that time series, you know, the histogram and autocorrelation function and CDF as well. All of these will give you an idea about what the actual properties of this series are. And again, you can do that for each of your, your time series. This one's interesting in the sense that it has quite strong seasonality happening there. You can see these undulating autocorrelations, um, et cetera. Okay. Um, something else that we're going to look at here, I've just got some code to look at the relationships between the logit transformed abundance and the predictors that we have. So uh, you might have seen when I highlighted the data that we've got values for temperature and NDVI, which is actually a moving average of NDVI, um, which are both probably quite relevant predictors of what's going on in this system. NDVI kind of controls the greenness um, of this system, <clears throat> or it doesn't control it, but it measures it. So here I've just got some ggplot code to say, take the logistic, uh, so the logit uh, of these relative abundances and then fit uh, a gam, a fit a smooth uh, to each of those predictors. Uh, in this case, we're using minimum temperature first and then NDVI down here and just putting those together just to sort of see some of these um, possible relationships. Um, again, these are just to the observed data, but it's kind of handy to understand what possible relationships might be uh, in the actual data. So there we see some relationships in here. Uh, for this species, we see some varying relationships, different kinds of shapes, um, estimated to be fairly linear in this case for these. Uh, and then we start to get a little bit more um, nonlinearities down here uh, when we look at this species, for example. And again, these are just a little bit of um, specify or understanding the data itself and thinking about what kinds of models we might want to fit. Um, to these data. But basically, by undoing that, and you can work through those yourselves or conclude, there might be some support for nonlinear effects here. So we might want to use splines to capture some of these relationships. And so something that I commonly do and that the package makes quite easy for you is, is working with different training and testing folds. When we're working with time series, and it's quite important to try and evaluate those models based on how well they predict if we can. Um, as one measure of predictive performance or one measure of sort of um, a criteria that we might want to use for choosing different models. And so here I'm splitting the data into a training set, which has all the time points up to time point 68. Uh, there are 80 total time points in these data and then a testing set. So when I feed these data to the package, it's only going to fit the model to the training set, um, but it'll generate predictions for the full uh, time series, the training and the testing sets. And here I'm going to show you uh, what it looks like uh, in the model inter in the interface. So MVGAM is the main workhorse function in the package. And generally, the first argument is the formula, just like in many other regression um, packages. And here I'm taking that relative abundance for each time series, and I'm fitting a hierarchical GAM. So I'm fitting uh, random slopes. Uh, or random intercepts rather for each uh, time series to capture the variation in that average um, relative abundance for each uh, species over time, as well as a hierarchical effect of minimum temperature. 
again, I won't go into details about how this works, um, but I highly recommend you look at Gavin Simpson's resources and some of his colleagues, Eric Peterson, for example, have a nice paper on, on hierarchical GAMs. But a useful thing that you can do is fit uh, a smooth function where each species shares some smooth function, in this case, a shared smooth of minimum temperature, as well as having its own deviation, I call it kind of a deviation smooth. Um, and so we can allow each time series here to have a, a separate smooth function of minimum temperature. Um, and by adding those together for each uh, species, each time series, we get the overall shape of their effective minimum temperature. So they're kind of learning jointly. This shared one is shared across all of them. And then we just estimate how each one deviates from that shared one. Then we feed in the training data uh, through the argument data, as well as any new data, which is basically data that we want to generate predictions for. So this is our testing data and the family itself. I'm using the command stand R um, interface as the back end. I highly recommend using that over R stand if you're going to use this package because command stand R is more up to date. It's a lighter weight package and it's not on CRAN, which means it doesn't have all the headaches of trying to meet CRAN requirements. And so they can update it much more quickly. Um, so it tends to be a lot faster and a lot more up to date than R stand, <clears throat> but it'll work with both. I'm going to fit this model just to highlight a little bit about what you might see when fitting these models, um, because you might see lots of messages that might be a little concerning to you if you haven't used these before. But basically, because we're using Stan as the backend, Stan needs to be compiled. Um, so it's going to make the model code for you, and it's going to start compiling. And the compilation really is one of the slowest steps often in these. So don't be concerned that that's happening. Um, it needs to be compiled down to C++. And so that's probably one of the biggest limitations, I guess, of any package that uses Stan is that you have to have a compiler um, that's set up. And that's why the installation can sometimes be a little bit challenging. Um, and But it's useful to understand a little bit about how this works. So you might get messages like this. This is all from your compiler going on, you get various messages, depending on what version of our tools you have, or if you're using a different one um, on Mac, for example. Um, but those aren't aren't anything to worry about. They're not they're not errors. Um, they're just warning messages about uh, the compiler language. So not an not an issue to be concerned about. And once the model starts fitting, you're going to see some other messages often when you're using GAMs, um, because these GAMs you know they can be so hugely flexible, and we're estimating uh, those basis coefficients as well as the penalties. Um, the initial values or the initial guesses for those penalties and for those basis functions can produce hugely um, wacky relationships before the sampler starts to move to the, the typical set and starts to actually give you better posterior estimates. So usually at the very beginning when the sampler starts, you can get some uh, warning messages about um, precision, precision matrices that aren't uh, positive definite or something like that. Um, but it's not anything that you need to be too concerned about. And here those are coming up. Um, as it's starting, I've got four chains running here, which is the default. And we're getting issues, not issues, but warnings about um, some of these highly constrained um, types um, giving you some, some weird results, not positive definite. But you'll see the sampler quickly moves away from those because um, it's only happening during the initial warm up phase or the burn in phase, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then once we start sampling, uh, then it tends to move very quickly. So this is a fairly complicated data set. You know, I've got 80 time points for four time series, uh, proportional data. So in a beta regression, we have to estimate all the uh, effects of the linear predictor. We've also got to estimate a preci precision parameter for each time series. Um, so again, reasonably complicated. And on my machine, which is probably three years old or so, this is taking 40 seconds after compilation to fit. So not too bad for a Bayesian our full full Bayesian inference, but again, it's not going to be the types of speeds that you're used to seeing if you're fitting in a maximum likelihood framework. Um, so just be aware of that. But often I find, you know, when fitting sort of univariate time series models, um, the compilation is by far the slowest, and then the fit might take five seconds or something like that. So after it's fit, um, Sometimes you can get some some messages here if you've had any kind of warnings about from the sampler. Uh, we don't seem to have any there. Uh, I've got the model actually written out the model syntax here for you as well. If you want to see, you know, you can see the full prior distribution here, um, but I won't go through that. Um, but something I want to highlight here, a real advantage of 
of these packages, um, MVGAM, which which sort of takes inspiration from BRMS in, in Stan, is to be able to produce the model code itself. If you've never worked in Stan, you know, it can be a bit overwhelming to look at this code, um, but this is the full probabilistic model here. And the reason I do this is try, to try and maintain complete transparency about what's going on, um, and as well as to be able to produce this model code so that you could actually um, change it if you wanted to. You could, you could produce the code and not actually fit the model there's an option to not run the model, but just produce the code and the data objects. And then you could change this if you wanted to add other kinds of effects or change things um, and then fit the model yourself. So again, if you haven't worked in Stan before, this might seem a bit overwhelming, but it's just good to know that it is there if you want to look at it. So if you're not sure what a prior distribution is, you can find it and it's completely transparent about what the prior is, for, it, for instance. You can update priors on basically any parameter as well in these models. Um, but the first thing to do, obviously, is to, to run the summary. And I'll show you what the summary looks like here. Again, we get lots and lots of coefficients here for these, uh, these beta coefficients. But at the very top, you get just the standard information about what, what the call was and what family you're using, et cetera, and what the link function is, and a little bit about how it was, was fit. Again, in a beta regression, each time series has its own precision parameter, which kind of controls the spread around the mean. Um, and then we've got the estimates of the beta coefficients. Um, for each of these, we get a credible interval estimate, as well as uh, some diagnostics about whether uh, the model has converged, because we've got four different chains here. We typically want these R hat values to be as close to one as possible, and the effective sample sizes to be large, basically. Um, we also get estimates for the random effects, the actual uh, mean and standard deviation for those. Um, estimates. You will get an approximate significance table from any splines that you use. Um, I'd be cautious about using those too much. Um, they're really sensitive to the estimate of the smoothing parameter, and I've found that you can get basically the same spline with a slightly different smoothing parameter and get quite different p-values, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on those too much. It's better to use predictions. And then you get information about diagnostics that you can read uh, there. So things that you can typically do, you can generate plots. So the package has support for Bayes plot, uh, which is very commonly used for lots of different plots for Bayesian models. So you can plot the R hats for all of your parameters just to make sure that they're generally concentrated around one. Of course, you can plot trace plots um, of lots of different types of parameters. If you leave the argument for parameters blank, then it'll just give you a plot of some of the main uh, parameters from the model. So again, the standard kind of plots to, to look at, at those trace plots to make sure everything seems to have converged well. Very helpful for diagnosing if you've got possible problems there that the sampler is encountering. Um, other things you can do is generate pairs plots. These are also very useful for understanding relationships between parameters uh, to try and find non-identifiabilities, for instance. Um, so again, you can do all of those, and there's there's uh, information in the help files about how to how to use these. But really, what we're interested in here is the actual smooth functions. And so, um, the smooth function that was estimated again was a shared smooth of minimum temperature, which is broadly found to sort of increase a little bit over values of minimum temperature, as well as the deviations. Um, this particular kind of smooth, uh, they just happen to be shown like this. Uh, which makes it a little hard to interpret, or very hard, I think, to interpret these and think, what do these actually mean? Um, so I tend to find looking at the smooth functions is OK, but we can often do better by making more targeted predictions. Um, here, we, we've got random effects here, so we can plot the random effects using the type equals RE in the plot. Um, and again, this is just not too bad in terms of interp interpreting these. Um, but again, these are all on the link scale. So I highlight those just to, just so you can get a sense of you can plot all these things, which is useful. You're probably used to seeing these kinds of plots if you've worked in MGCV. But the, the marginal effects package makes predictions much easier, and it makes it easier to understand the model. So for example, we can take a more targeted plot and say, well, what if we plot predictions on the outcome scale for minimum temperature, and then we um, facet that by series? 
um, that might make it a little bit easier to understand. And here we're actually seeing what are the actual predictions on the outcome scale for that effect of minimum temperature. And you can see some of these are estimated to be kind of broadly nonlinear, and some of them seem to be, have been regularized more to be kind of linear effects. Um, so this is much more valuable um, for being able to actually understand what are the consequences of this model? What, what assumptions is it making? Um, we can make the same plot on the link scale by changing type equals link uh, in the plot predictions function. And there's very good uh, resources uh, that have been made for the marginal effects package. Again, so these are the combination of that shared smooth and the, the series level smooth all in one plot which is much easier to understand than if we look at them as separate plots. <clears throat> we can plot the slopes or the average sort of marginal effect of minimum temperature for each uh, series to get a sense of uh, the sort of marginal contribution. Uh, and again, so uh, some series seem to de decrease in relative abundance as temperature increases and some se seem to increase, which makes sense in this system some of these species are, are quite seasonal in, in their dynamics and those seasons don't necessarily line up. Other kinds of predictions you can make, you can make posterior contrasts, for example, here I'm just showing you an example. Say if I wanted to say, okay, what happens if I change minimum temperature from negative 1.75 to 1.75? This is a, a variable that's already been scaled to unit variance. Now, so that's say a very low minimum temperature to a high minimum temperature. And what, what does the model expect to see? Um, just to show you some code about how that can be done. And we can plot that with tidy bays to get a sense here, you know, which ones tend to increase the most as you change minimum temperature and which tend to decrease the most. <clears throat> okay, so those are all very easy to do. And all of these work because there's an underlying predict fun function in the package that marginal effects understands how to use. You can plot forecasts from these. So, uh, and we can see that there's no dynamic component here. So these uh, forecasts aren't changing much over time, but they're just capturing the seasonality. Um, and again, these are gonna show you the hindcast period in gray and the forecast period for each time series. Um, other things we can do is look at residual diagnostics. Um, so here are the randomized quantile residuals for the first time series. And you can see there's, we're not really capturing that norm, normal sort of QQ assumption. There's some relationship um, between the fitted values and the residuals, and we're getting lots of autocorrelation in those residuals. Um, and that's going to happen for each of our time series. So you can plot these for each time series and see that the model overall is starting to, is not really capturing those temporal dynamics. And obviously we'd want to capture those if we can. Um, and so a second model that I, I'm going to use here, which I've already pre-fit because I don't want to wait for it to compile. Um, the fitting takes about 50 to 60 seconds, so not too bad. Um, but I've already actually pre-fit this one. Is one that now takes the same strategy, but now we have a multi-dimensional spline of minimum temperature and NDVI, which is that moving average. And again, doing this in a hierarchical way. So each species function is learned from the, the whole community of species. So slight level change in complexity. Um, and again, I show you how this model can be described there. And I'll just show you a feature here. So for example, if we run the summary of this model, we can actually suppress those beta coefficients. So it doesn't end up being a huge summary. Again, there might be hundreds of, of coefficients in here. And again, you can see the call there. Um, we still get information on the precision parameters, for instance, and other things and the approximate significance, but it's just suppressed a lot of those um, basis function estimates, which are not really informative anyway. Um, again, we can plot the diagnostics. The smooths in this case are now bi, um, bivariate smooths. So you know, we've got the shared smooth across all species, and then we've got for each species, how, how it smooth deviates from that shared smooth. Um, again, these are hard to interpret or maybe impossible to interpret just by looking at them. Um, so they're not all that useful, I find. Um, much easier to make targeted predictions, but still they're there if you want to look at those. And there's another one over here that, that wasn't shown. Again, you can use uh, functions from the Gratia package that Gavin Simpson maintains, which will give you much nicer plots of these kinds of things, especially multidimensional ones. So if we just hit the draw function and feed it the actual underlying MGCV model, we get um, plots of all of the effects in the model. 
And this is better because we get a targeted legend here. So it's easier to understand what these things are showing. But again, the function for each species is a combination of its own function and the shared function. So it's still very hard to fully understand these. And so again, I like to use plot predictions to make much easier uh, comparisons. And so here I'm looking at that relationship between minimum temperature and NDVI for each uh, time series. And here you can start to see a little bit of those, how they change, how the interaction between those two changes. So it takes five different values across the range of NDVI observations and plots a different curve um, against minimum temperature for each um, species in this case. Um, we can also change those around so that NDVI comes on the x-axis um, and, and we're faceting by uh, minimum temperature. And here again, you can start to see uh, some of these nonlinear relationships that are being estimated um, for these variables and how they interact with one another. So some interactions there, particularly for this species at the bottom and this one at the top left, and maybe these other two, there's not much support for an interaction, so it get, gets regularized to one common function. And again, you can look at these on the link scale if you want as well, um, just to highlight those might be a little bit smoother um, because they're not going to take into account the observation error. Other things you can do with these. So MVGAM has support for the Lou package, which uses approximate leave one out cross validation to sort of kind of like a Bayesian um, fitting criteria like an AIC. And these can be commonly used to sort of compare models. For example, if I compare the first one and the second one, um, you can compare as many models as you want in one call to this Lou function. Um, what we want is a higher value of this ELPD, this um, log predictive density. And model two has a slightly higher, the more complex model. Um, but there's a lot of variation. You know, it's not sort of, you wouldn't call it sort of significantly um, better than model one. So we haven't gained a huge amount in terms of um, leave one out cross validation uh, performance for this model compared to the simpler model. But those can be useful for sort of um, understanding models and, and which ones are uh, fitting better and which ones aren't. There are various types of posterior predictive checks you can fit as well. Uh, I won't look into those just to save in the interest of time. But again, if we look at the predictions for this model, they haven't really changed a huge amount. We get a little bit maybe more nonlinearity for some of these species in terms of their predictions, but they're not capturing the overall temporal trend. And our residuals are also going to show uh, problems there of autocorrelation. Uh, for instance, if we look at this one, uh, we're still going to get the same kind of pattern. Maybe it's slightly better for that one, but some of the other ones, it's, it's still got issues there of autocorrelation. So the final model that I'm going to fit in this coding exercise just highlights how you can do something quite different for this model uh, in this package. For instance, here, I'm now changing to a state space format. So I've got the observation formula, which is empty in this case, because I don't have any predictors that I think impact our ability to take measurements of these species, although we could have those, um, like observer effects, for example, or storms uh, on the day of, of counting. But then I've also got my trend formula, so the formula for the, the latent process model. And I've moved the, any smooth functions down to there just to show how this works. Um, so we've got random intercepts again, and, we, and when we, whenever we work in the trend formula, instead of using series as the indicator, we use trend as the indicator. And that's because this package can let you share the same latent process model for multiple observation time series. Um, and so we need a different indicator there. So again, the same functions here, same uh, tensor products of minimum temperature and in DVI and random uh, intercepts. But in, now this is all happening on the process model. And that process model also has an autoregressive uh, component, an AR1. So that should capture, hopefully, those latent uh, dynamics. I also show how you can put priors on these. So I'm putting priors, say, on the AR1 coefficients to force them to be stationary, so restricted between negative 1 and 1 as well as a prior, an informative prior on the uh, process error. Um, you can use BRMS routines for placing priors, which is very handy because BRMS is a really nice, simple way to put priors on parameters. So I'm just showing you how you can do that there. Again, I'm not going to fit this model because um, it takes a little while to compile. It, it still only takes around a minute or so to fit, um, but the compilation is something that we don't really want to wait on. But I just want to highlight, uh, again, what this model looks like.
when you when you see it. You can look at the code as well for any of these models. But if we look at the summary now, um, you can see some slight warnings here, nothing too major um, there at the bottom. But what we're getting here um, is we still get the precision parameter estimates for the beta observation model, but now we've got process model coefficients. Um, so we've got the AR coefficients for each um, time series, as well as the um, process error. And these are a little bit hard to identify. So we're getting some slightly higher R hats for these. We might want to work on those a bit. But overall, uh, everything's fitting quite nicely. And you will get an approximate significance, again, of any smooths that are on the process model, as well as the observation model, um, which there are none in this particular example. Um, everything else works the same, though. You know, the summary works the same. Um, we can use base plot again, to look at the AR1 coefficients, which we can see are strongly positive, which is not surprising in this model. And that should hopefully capture that autocorrelation. Um, plotting the smooths is the same. We just have to set trend effects equals true if we want to look at the actual process effects because um, there are no smooths in the observation model and they're going to look basically the sim similar. They're often estimated to be a bit cleaner when you estimate them on the process model as, as opposed to the observation model, but they're going to behave the same way. Um, plot predictions will work in the same way as well. So we can still make plots on the observation scale um, for each of these series um, for minimum temperature and in DVI. And again, overall, the shapes haven't changed a lot. They've gotten a little bit cleaner, um, which is, again, not surprising the way that we formulated the model. Uh, and the uncertainty might be a little bit wider because this is now incorporating uncertainty in the process error. Um, <clears throat> But again, overall, the, the inference wouldn't change much for this model. Again, these can be plotted on the link scale. So none of this changes uh, depending on whether you're working on the um, observation uh, model or the process model. But the predictions are different. Okay, And so this is something that we want to highlight. So now we're fitting the in-sample data much better and we're getting more realistic predictions. I will make a note here that um, if you're working through this example, none of these models are going to generate great forecasts because there was actually a change happening at the time of the actual forecast horizon. Uh, the site was undergoing a drought and the species were, were shuffling and rearranging. So really interesting system and good to highlight that you can have a model that fits really well to the historical data, but it doesn't mean it's going to give great predictions. That's which is why we want to do these kind of exercises. But again, we're getting much more realistic predictions for each of these um, time series. Um, and we can get proper scoring rules of those as well. Um, <clears throat> OK, and looking at the residuals, these are all obviously should look a lot better. Um, normal, normal plots looking much more realistic, much, no autocorrelation left in our uh, residuals for each of these uh, time series. So we'd be a lot happier that we're capturing more of the um, autocorrelation in the, the sort of latent trend in this model, which would give us more confidence to make inferences from what anything else that we put in the model. Again, if we compare all three models now, Remember, we want a larger score here for this approximate leave one out cross validation. And model three, which is the more complex model, is much larger um, than the other two models. So it gives much better in sample fit. Just to highlight a little bit about what the PPC function does, we can generate posterior predictive checks in here, the posterior predictive densities for each of our time series. So this will overlay the observed density in black with the predicted densities as quantiles. And again, all of the, all, for all these series, we're generally capturing the features of the data pretty well. The last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up is evaluating forecasts. Because we fed the new data to the model, um, we already have a forecast. It's just a matter of extracting it. Um, but if you don't actually feed th this new data here, um, then you need to generate the forecast. And the package will automatically do that for you. It's just a matter of feeding new data to the forecast function. Here I'm feeding new data, um, but I don't really need to. Um, it's already in there. So this is just a matter of extracting the forecast. And this will give you a new object of class MVGAM forecast, which has its own methods for plotting and other things that you can do with it. But one thing you can do is, is generate um, proper scoring rules so you can score these. Here I'm going to use the energy score, which is a multivariate uh, scoring rule, um, which tries to understand calibration of multivariate forecasts. <clears throat> 
Um, this is a score that you want to be smaller if possible. And just to show what this returns, it basically returns a list where for each series you get a data frame and it'll tell you some information about was it in the interval or not, whatever interval you specify. In this case, the interval was 0.9, I believe, by default. And it tells you the evaluation horizon. Because this is a multivariate score, we don't actually get a score for each series. We only get an overall score, which is in the all series um, slot of this list. <clears throat> so if we have a look at that, uh, here's one for, for one series, for instance. Sorry to keep going back and forth. But again, just tells us, was it in the interval or not? We get NAs when there was a missing value, whatever the interval width. So these should be in a format that make it easy to do sort of tidy plotting through ggplot. If we look at the all series one, then we actually get the score um, at the evaluation horizon. Again, missing values for the observations are going to give you a missing value for the score. Um, but these values you could directly compare between competing models and say, well, which model is doing better? <clears throat> um, and again, we want a, a smaller score here. So just to show one final thing of how I might do that, um, I can compute the score for model two, um, which is did not have the dynamic component. And I'll take the difference between the two. Um, and the way that I'm taking the difference, any value below zero means the dynamic model gave better forecasts in that particular horizon. Um, and you can see the dynamic model gives better forecasts at every single forecast horizon in this example. And so that, again, not surprising. Um, that's all I have to talk about when walking through the code. I do have examples that I'm not going to run here to show you different way, different things you can do with this data. Um, you can fit multivariate dynamic models with dynamic factors or with a vector autoregression if you want and sort of interrogate those and understand how they work. Um, but I think it's best to wrap up here so we have time for, for questions. Thank you very much, Nick. I was uh, checking the questions on the on the list. OK, so can you have a missing 10 points in the time column? For example, time can be 1, 2, 4, 7, 8, 12. So it's missing 3, 5, 6, and 9. So those kind of types of questions. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes, you can have time points when you haven't taken observations. You still need them in the data. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 has to go sequentially up. But you would just have missing values in the observations. <clears throat> OK, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Okay, and then a follow up. So, is there any support at this time for missing values in the model covariates? Yeah, not for the covariates, and that's something that you know people would have to sort of think about the best way to handle that. Um, I guess you would use some kind of interpolation of the covariates before fitting the model, or you could, if you wanted to go the whole hog and basically set up the model structure as you want with all the data that you need and the model um, code, the actual stand code but not fit it and then update the model code for the stand code so you could actually fit a model to the covariates as well if you wanted to, which would be a little challenging when working with splines, but something that could be done. OK, OK, excellent. Thank you. And uh, when you do forecast, do you specify the new time you want to forecast to, or does the model automatically use the default forecast time period? For example, in the tutorial, you forecast to 80, so from 64 to 80. Can we define our forecast range? That's a good question. Yeah, and that's basically controlled entirely by what's in that the new data that you feed. So um, the new data that was fed there was this data test. And so if we just, I'll just open it like this and you can get a look at it. It's basically going to have all the time points that you need and it's going to generate predictions for any of these time points. So it will assume that any new data that you feed, that it continues on basically from the last time point of the training data. Um, so it's important to have that set up. So making sure you understand how you're splitting the data, um, but that's how it's going to work. So anything you put in there in the new data, it's going to generate a, a forecast for. Um, so it's really up to the user how far ahead they want to want to forecast. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And the next question will be: Is it possible to have a file or all the AR parameters shared or common across time series rather rather than fitting one per time series? Should one think this should be the same across the time series and put some sort of hierarchical prior on those time series parameters for partial pooling? That's, That's a really good question. Yeah, and at the moment, it it does make the assumption that they're independent, at least for the when we have a univariate um, 
time series components. So here we were just fitting a separate AR model to each um, species, and there was no partial pooling there. When you fit a multivariate one, like a vector autoregression, they will be shared. They'll be learned together. Um, but I haven't implemented in the package for hierarchical AR effects, for example. But I think that's a really valuable um, thing that could be done. Again, it wouldn't be too hard to modify the model code to be able to do that. Um, but it's something that the user at the, at the moment would have to do themselves. OK, thank you, Nick. Uh, the next question will be, can you bin observations? Time to observation, distance, and remove sampling models require multiple observation per time point. Is there something that your package can accommodate? So put the observation into different bin, bin groups, I guess. Yeah, that's a question. Yeah, you could. I mean, you would basically, each group would be a sort of separate time series and you would link them together somehow. Um, so, you know, technically here we have multiple observations for a time point. We just have an observation of each species at each time point but you could have an observation of each bin at each time point. Um, and that would be interesting. You know, you, you might want to think about augmenting it to say, to try and capture the relationships between those bins and kind of a Dirichlet, for example, observation model, which the package currently can't do. But if they were binned and you had relative proportions like we do here, um, then a beta regression would work or whatever kind of, kind of observation model you need. But basically, yes, I would have each bin would be its own time series. In that case, is kind of how I would approach it. Okay, thank you for the detailed answer. And then there are some questions on the technical side of the package. If the data has several thousand observations, will the package be, get difficult to fit? Will that take a long, longer time? Like how, how does the MVGAM deal with larger data set? Yeah, that's a good question. And it, it really depends, I guess, you know, the, the complexity of the model, it's gonna depend on how informative the data are for whatever model you're trying to, to fit. Um, <clears throat> so you can, if you have a univariate series or a small number of series and you've got many thousands, there are options for multi-threading in Stan. So each chain can actually be split across multiple threads if you have that set up on your, on your machine. And that can work when you have many thousands of observations. It really, it doesn't make much difference unless you have many thousands. So that's one way of speeding it up. Um, also, you can use variational inference through STAN rather than full MCMC, which tends to be faster, but might give slightly different fits. Um, but yeah, it really just depends. Um, I think that's, you know, that's the biggest kind of hurdle to using a package like this when we're used to being able to fit things very quickly in R uh, for, for large data sets. As, as soon as you get into these MCMC-based um, um, packages, you're going to have to wait basically for them to fit. So it, it really can be variable. I fit models that fit you know, in under a second uh, with a fair number of data points because they were simple um, and the data were informative. But I've also fit models that where it can take two hours or three hours uh, for very complex models, um, even when there aren't that many data points. So it, it's kind of hard to say. It just depends. OK, thank you very much, Nick. Maybe just one last question, a uh, more broad version of the question. So, can the can can the can, is there use for such models if you are not working with time series data per se? Yeah, you can. I mean, it's really set up for time series. So all the post processing is set up so you can quickly get forecasts and do all the things that you want to do with uh, with time series. But you could have a model where you don't fit a dynamic process. Um, you still need a time indicator, but the time indicator can just meet, be meaningless in the in the package. You just add an indicator of whatever the row number is um, and just go from there. And you can fit the same kinds of models. But I think when you get into that, you know, you might be better off using something like BRMS, uh, which is a little more flexible in what it can do. Um, it doesn't have the support for time series that MVGAM does, but you can do all the same kinds of things and even more things if you're not working specifically with with time series. But yes, in a, in a nutshell, you can fit models that, that aren't actually time series. OK, yeah. Thank you so much, Nick. That's a very amazing talk. And thanks for the video the tutorial on those packages. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just say I'm, I'm happy to answer questions later on if people want to send them. You know, I'm happy to work through those and, and post them uh, back on the on the GitHub repo. Um, so that's, that's not a problem. Very easy to do that. OK, thanks again, Nick.